Well, welcome to Burn the Ship, my friend. First of all, thanks for making the trip, especially when it sucks outside. Um, I say that to everybody, but it does mean a lot for making the trip and coming up here and doing with us face to face. I appreciate it very much. Uh, this is Burn the Ship. Our goal of Burn the Ship is to connect entrepreneurs with professionals that can help you go all in on your business. We talk to entrepreneurs that walk the walk and talk the talk and have been through all the things that you experience as a small business owner. Um, and our goal really is to kind of figure out what you're good at, package up those skills a little bit and try to teach that to that next generation of entrepreneurs. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Well, again, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. My name is Khalif Legend. I'm the owner of The Plug ATL. Uh, we have a small media production studio in Brookhaven uh, where we do commercial projects production, but we also support people in the way of content creation, uh, brandings more specifically. Uh, so yeah, me and my wife, background is commercial production. We've been doing that for a little over 12 years. We decided to open up the studio round about before COVID, and I'm gonna tell you why. Um, before COVID, I had cancer. Uh, and I remember, and I'm going to tell you the story behind the whole thing. It's interesting. I remember it was, I was 34 and I had been working out and I lost all this weight unbeknownst to me. Right. <laughs> so I'm losing this weight and I'm working out and I'm in the gym and I'm getting strong. And so my goal was to have a birthday celebration because I didn't celebrate my birthday as much. The theme of the birthday was 35 in the life. Right. So my birthday is February. Buddy of mine, right? Now, I had been having some issues, uh, you know, health issues related to a buddy of mine who said, hey, I'm having some issues. This was, I would say, November, around Thanksgiving before my birthday in February. So, remember, I'm still ramping up for this huge 35 in a life campaign. I might have lost about 40 pounds over the course of a year. And so he was like, he was having some similar pains. And he went to the doctor and said, yeah, man, I got cancer. And this was Thanksgiving Day. Wow. That night I was at the hospital <laughs> um, yeah. because I'm panicking now because I'm like, he's dealing with some of the same issues I'm dealing with, right? Keep in mind, we're still, you know, working commercial production. Me and my wife were on set. And, um, you know, this is just weighing on my mind. And so I go get checked out, and they're like, well, they didn't see anything, but they told me to come back around December just for a checkup. So I go back in for a checkup. I get checked out, and they would say, well, we want to do some scans in January. So I'm doing a, t a 10K bike ride, mm. right? So because, uh, yeah, I'm like on yeah. this health kick. For sure. You know, this is a guy I'm drinking a gallon of water a day uh, with lemon juice and baking soda because they said mm. it's alkaline inside mm, right. of it and you can raise your pH. So I'm yeah. deep into all this stuff, right? And so January, I go in, late January, to go get this scan, CAT scan. Never done it before in my life. Uh, I went in that morning about 8 o'clock. So I leave there, go straight, do the 10K. I'm riding the bike. I get a phone call as I just complete the 10K. And they told me I need to get back to the hospital ASAP. So at this point, right. alarms are going off because my buddy who's going through his situation with his cancer battle, now I'm being presented with something that seems to be eerily familiar so I go back and I get the report and they're like, yeah, we see a lot of things going on inside your stomach. So we're going to need to refer you to an oncologist. And so this is right before my birthday. I go and see the oncologist. They do a biopsy. And she's like, yeah, you got cancer. Wow. So you can say that kind of rained on my whole party for 35 and alive. Yeah. <laughs> but I will tell you this. Now, cancer is a tricky thing. Um, I'm very, I have a weird sense of humor. So during this time, I'm prepping still for my birthday because this is also around the Super Bowl time. Um, I go to a store with a cousin of mine. We're always joking about stuff. And I said, you know what I'm doing? I'm going to wear a shirt that says uh, the good die young. And he was like, man, don't do that. That would be in bad taste. But that's the kind of thing, right? <laughs> you know, I just, just have a weird sense of humor. Yeah. I remember I one. Can, I think we can relate. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So you get it, right? Yep. And because one of the nurses who was my nurse during the time, she said, look, one of the things that's going to help you kick this thing, you got to keep a sense of humor. You got to laugh. Absolutely. You got to laugh. And so, you know, that was one of the things like I took wholeheartedly. She was like, you got to laugh and you got to work out. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm already working out and I can find humor and some strange stuff. So, <laughs> right. For me, yeah. this was like, OK, this is going to be easy. I mean, long story short, we get through that. But during that time of having cancer, I'm like, look. I want to do something beyond just working commercial. I want to do something bigger than this. I want to do something that 
if and when I die, which won't be now, it won't be cancer. Right. Like, I already made up in my mind I was going to beat that, right? That I needed something that was going to outlast me. I love that. And so for me, I was already into podcasting. I didn't make any of my own. I just like to listen, sure. right? And so for me, I'm like, well, what if we create a space where people can not only do that, but they can also do photography, they can film stuff, you know, create some spaces, right? And so my wife was like, well, maybe you should create that space. And she was like, well, why don't you call it the plug? And I'm like, why is that? Because prior to me being in production, I used to be a barber. Okay. And, you know, barbers know everybody. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like, we know everybody. Yep. You need tires. You need bed sheets, you need towels, whatever you need. I Even you. if it's oodles or noodles, they can get it to you. Yep. So she was like, we should just call it the plug. Great place where people can connect. And so that's what we did, and we created the plug. And so, yeah, in doing so, creating the plug, um, we opened our doors March the 6th, a week before the world went into lockdown, wow. COVID. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just signed this huge lease, 8,000 square foot building. And we even, we hadn't even started in construction yet yeah. in Brookhaven, yeah. right? So it's like, wow, what are we going to do? And so what we did do, I said, well, we're just going to build, right? For me, because I'm also a brother of faith, right? And so for me, it was like, well, just do what Noah did. He just built, and he had never seen rain, right? Yeah, sure. So he just built this thing on what he heard, and it's like, well, wow. Eventually rain came. And so that's what we did. We just built the studio out. And then what I did was I took a class in Facebook marketing, how to do direct marketing, right. target marketing. Yep. So I did that. And then so what we did from there, we just took a small budget and we just started, you know, flooding the market with content. Mm -hmm. And then it worked. So as the, you know, studios open back up, people were interested because they're like, well, we got this space for anybody looking to create content, looking to do a podcast, looking to do anything related to content and branding. This is the space. And, you know, it did pretty well. And so, you know, it has sustained us for a while. But we realized as people began to come in and make content, a lot of the content was bad. Mm -hmm. And how do you say to somebody, you know, your content is bad? Uh, and it happened a lot. And so one day I got the idea, I was like, well, let's sit down and let me ask you, why are you doing this, right? And then that led into a whole bunch of other stuff. But it helped me to understand that, one, most people who are in business or entrepreneurs have no idea what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that to demolish or diminish or make anybody feel bad. I understand that most entrepreneurs, before they come in, have the skill, Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They can do, they can work with their hand, they can produce mm -hmm. the product, right? But they don't know how to pitch it. Yeah. Right? right? Or something. There, There's that one piece. Right. You know, there, it's, there's several pieces of that whole cycle. And like that's r literally where we started with this podcast is like mm -hmm. how to start a production company. You know, and I go to Google. <laughs> and five minutes later, Gary Vee's telling me how dumb I am because I don't already have a million dollars. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so no, I can... P even if you have your skill, there's no real good place to go to learn how to put the whole picture together. So, And that's not – you can say it in like a diminishing way to people like, oh, you don't understand the whole – the whole story like you don't understand the whole process that you need to be able to have this business be successful mm -hmm. good news nobody starts That's out it. knowing the whole thing no, almost no one starts out knowing the whole thing so it's not it's not a rare thing like it it's almost empowering to me i agree with that you yeah. know for people to be yeah. like hey I, I didn't know either you know I, and now i get to share my i didn't know either talk to people all the time it's a really powerful thing so i i can relate absolutely 100 percent Mm -hmm. I think it was Bob Iger who had the uh, master class I was listening to, which is great, by the way. Mm -hmm. Helped me a whole lot. I don't know if it was him, but he somebody said to the effect that great leaders don't necessarily know the next steps. Mm -hmm. They just take them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So often you see people moving into the space of business, right? And they work with people, and then they see people move ahead, and they get further. And my thought, and I think it for me got to a place where because I remember working with people early in our business development, trying to learn what we needed to learn and figure it out, who moved on and did, you know, bigger and better things. And my, my mind, I'm like, wow, what am I doing? This is trash as well, too. Like, I'm <laughs> telling these people that they can't do this. But then I realized something is that it's not that they get further. It's just that they moved on mm -hmm. in the direction they needed to go. Yeah, for sure. And 
complacency or the idea of confusion, right? Confusion does an odd thing, which is why deers always get the raw end of a stick, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's because when they see them headlights, there's the automatic confusion. Like, what is going on here? But typically what happens with confusion, people don't move mm -hmm. or they're not point. motivated to mm -hmm. move. And so as a result, out of the lack of motivation, you stand still. And in that standing still, there's a lot of reflection happening. That's not a good thing because I'm also like a daydreamer. Mm -hmm. So I can spend a lot of time in my mind just daydreaming about stuff and not getting stuff done, right, as opposed to just taking the next step, right? Mm -hmm. Just doing an actionable thing. Yeah, just yeah. doing an actionable thing, getting further, farther than where you were yesterday. And so, you know, you see that a lot with businesses or entrepreneurs really specifically because I work with entrepreneurs or, you know, solopreneurs, like people who are funding this thing themselves, and it's tough, like, to look them in the eyes and say, well, yeah, you're going to have to go back to the drawing board. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. how do you say that? Like, you've just paid this team to do this, this team to do this, this team to do this, this team to do this. And right? your content's bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but you still haven't even developed. We talked about the why. Yeah. Right? Right. You don't even know why you're doing it. And so, and even with us, you know, a lot of people we do work with, like, again, we, it's tough if a person or a business doesn't know what they're in business for. Like, I know you're selling shoes, right? Sure. But there's a thousand shoes out there. But what's unique about your shoe? What's the differentiator? Yeah. Yep. And when you ask that question, it's like deer in the headlights. You're confused. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, yeah, like, you really have to unpack why you do what you do. It's not enough just to sell. Because this is what happened in business, I've learned. And I think it's, um, what's his name? Self Golden, who talks about mm -hmm. commodity versus brand. Mm -hmm. And I love the way he illustrates it because he says that if you close your eyes and you imagine that Nike was going to open up a hotel, mm -hmm. you can almost envision what that hotel would look like and be like. Sure. Versus if Hyatt closed your eyes, decided that they're going to design a shoe, mm -hmm. what would that shoe look like? You yeah. don't know because yeah. brand. Same pattern as my, yeah. my cover sheet in my hotel. Exactly. <laughs> versus commodity. Yeah. And when people are doing business or they're shopping for a product, they're either looking for brand like Gucci or they're doing price line for hotel. Mm -hmm. Cause now you're shopping on price. Yep. And then the reality is that most people we interact with, they want to be a brand, right? They want that Nike experience, right? right? But they're selling commodity. Like they're advertising, they copy their speech, like the graphics, everything is going this direction, right? And so then our goal is to try to bring them back, like, over here. But we have to start with the why. Disney, or not Disney, but Nike is just do it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's very simple. Sure. Like, don't get complicated. And, he, you know, my mentor talks about, like, don't get caught up on a logo. Yeah. Like, you're not even there yet. Right. Like, you're not on the side of a plane that you need to be worried about if this is articulator shape, right? Yeah. Like, just start yeah. doing. And so, you know. Getting to the why, getting people to the place of the doing so they can see some quick wins mm -hmm. is really effective in helping people build momentum and For courage sure. to kind of push. Yeah, and momentum is uh, addictive. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a good word for it. Motion is addictive yeah. for sure. So you get to this point where you're ingesting some of the content that you're helping kind of provide the habitat to create right and it's not good and people aren't understanding the why they do what they do what is your band-aid for that do you get into the coaching and teaching aspect or so yeah it didn't start out that way but when we looked at our calendar what people were booking was consultation yeah and so i said well wow this is like a triage mm -hmm. because this is like people are coming in like an emergency room and we have to assess the situation we have to provide a diagnosis, like much yeah, like me, yeah. and then there's a treatment, mm -hmm. right? And based on where they are, you have to go through those steps, you know. Uh, but even after that, there's like checkups or check-ins, right, yeah. where you still have yeah, to periodically. Yeah. And that's where the community part came in, supporting yeah. these people, right, to where it's like, okay, we have an agency where we work or we do commercial work. But then the other part where we support people in their business on an ongoing basis, even if it's consultation or, you know, helping them develop, you know, content strategies yeah. and yeah. things for that uh, because it was necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's almost like this for every day, you know, there's a new sucker born. And I don't mean to say it like that in no, a way that's just ingenuous, yeah. but it's like there's new people born every day. There's new people who are looking to become entrepreneurs or become self-sufficient. And so the goal is that to create a framework 
right, that helps them, and then rinse and repeat because there's sure. a new generation, yep. you know, which is ironic because we have a program with the Cab County where we do this with kids. Okay. So we get high school students and we're teaching them basic just in content creation. It's a great experience. Film, yeah. television, all that other stuff. So they get that experience because, you know, again, it's like once you develop the skill of the tech for one, creating great content, but two, the actual uh, physicality or the technical st- the skills of doing that, you can also provide. Mm-hmm. Keep in mind, like, I didn't go to college. Like, I don't even think I made a high school. I'm not even sure because it was such a blur during mm-hmm. those years. But I developed a skill. And so even in that, it's like being able to provide that opportunity through coaching, through teaching, sure. or whatever we can, you know. It's almost like you're ensuring that the next generation won't burn it all down. Right. right. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, you're yeah. creating that vision for them early, early yeah, in the process, absolutely. right? Yeah. 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 So, you know, the long, I guess the long end of the question is that helping people or the coaching aspect became necessary because that's what the people almost demanded. Right? Yeah. It was like, we can create content, we can create, we can create, but what are we doing? Let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. How do you adjust your goals from here? Right? Because you, you, you're in that um, – you know, not now, but you're in that building that framework mm-hmm. phase. Like you're a ton of learning and understanding of what the what the issue is. You know, you're almost diagnosing things mm-hmm. within other people's business, and then you align your goals to support people in a way that is in line with who you are as a person. You've learned a lot. You know a lot. Like, I think we can both see that. Absolutely. Yeah. Where is your next level up? Where, where does your next plateau go from here? Well, quite honestly, um, one thing I will say that I'm a natural introvert. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have a lot of things in common. Right? Yeah, so it's natural for me to shy away and only deal with the few. But I do understand that there is, you know, people out there who need help. And that's the thing that really gets you, right, is yeah, when man. you can help. You know, there's nothing worse than the kid who comes to school with the science fair project, and you can tell that nobody at home helped him do his project, right? Mm-hmm. He had great inspiration, great ideas, but when the reality of it, and it's judged, right, mm-hmm. that can really weigh on you psychologically. So And so my goal for people who are businesses, entrepreneurs, or solopreneurs who are looking to get into the space of creating content for the businesses and brands is to kind of be like that parent who should have been at home with that one kid for his yeah. science project, yeah. right, to help support them. Yeah. And so really just to expand what that looks like. Because it's still theirs. Yeah. yeah. It's still it's their, the execution it's the still their creation, still their inspiration, yep. you yeah. know. And if you can be the vehicle for for that to come to fruition is a special thing. Yeah. I'm just now at the science fair age. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like my my kid is just now yeah. six, mm-hmm. and we are in that phase. Like we are in the you just got a camera for Christmas mm-hmm. because he he's convinced that I don't have a real job. By the mm-hmm. way, he sees me on YouTube every now and then. He says, "Oh, my dad's a YouTuber and a streamer." <laughs> I wish that was the case. And so he got a camera for Christmas, and now we're at the. I can show you how to trim, you know. I, I can show you how to use DaVinci. You oh, ain't at the premier level okay. yet, but let, yeah. let's start you out on DaVinci. It's nice and free. Mm-hmm. You know, let's get you a camera. Let's let you create some of your own stuff. And it it's so much more rewarding from a business perspective, from a personal perspective, from a family perspective, to be a piece of the engine that helps people create their own stuff. Sure. An enabler. A hundred percent, like yeah. and in a positive way. Mm-hmm. You know, that's mm-hmm. not a that's not a word used. It doesn't have to be negative. Very yeah. positively, right. a lot. Yeah, but you can enable people to do cool stuff. Absolutely. And um, empower is probably the better word. But yeah, well, yeah, you know, teach there. <laughs> I call it Alice, but Thank no, you. that's cool. That that where you're at mentally is a, is a unique thing. I love it. Mm-hmm. It's not normal. Mm-mm. You know what I mean? Like what the way that your mind is working in these and working through these problems and that you know you need to help it for other people to provide value to those people is not the the thought process that a lot of people subscribe to. It's it's reverse engineered of that. It's like what is my skill and then how do I lay my skill out in front of people until I take work and yours is like you're di- diagnosing the skills of other people and then adding them to your bag so that you can be a a, a piece of ammunition to the people that are pushing their agenda forward like it's literally i don't know that there's a thing that embodies what burn the ship is to us more than that is like how can we bottle up some of this stuff and teach it to you so you can make it your own thing because it's still your own thing which is so cool to me um 
what would you say was like your superpower at the beginning? Like, what did you do really well? Was it was it the hunger for knowledge or like the the desire to continue and and add to your tool belt that you think was the most valuable thing when it started to grow in this business and letting this business kind of take its shape? Like, what was that thing for you in your eyes? There was, I tell you, there was three things specifically uh, because, you know, when you ask a person a thing, and we all have triggers and traumas, right? Um, most things start from childhood. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is that a wise man knows that he knows nothing at all. So I'm ever learning, mm. you know, because I just want the information. Yeah. Because I truly believe that all information is for all people. Yeah. And so that's the first piece. The second piece is that I'm a good storyteller. And yeah. I'm going to tell you why. Because I'm a natural introvert, it didn't happen that way. When I was five, my sister and I was playing. She pushed me into the corner of a door and chipped my tooth. Okay. Now, that tooth remained chipped until I was 16. Wow. So you can imagine in school when it came to jokes, mm -hmm. I was at the butt. Of it. Yeah. So it made sense to just be quiet and listen. Mm -hmm. So from 6 to 15, I did a lot of listening to people. And that was I, me at 14 years <laughs> old at 6'1 yeah. and 125 pounds. Yeah. 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 That was me a foot taller than everybody in my wow. middle school. Yeah. 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 All right. That's your second thing. What was your third thing? Uh, and then the other thing was just the deep passion to prove people wrong. The assumption was, well, again, because I come from a poor community, um, you know, my brother died young, you know, drugs, um, HIV, like just hard. My brother been in jail like maybe 52 times, seriously, yeah. right? So I come from that background. And so you hear a lot like you're not going to do much with your life. You know mm -hmm. that, right? It's said in other ways. But the point is that you will not be a productive citizen because everybody around you is unproductive. Yeah. Yeah. For me, that's all the gas I need. That yeah, because thing. now I will spend my life to prove you wrong. You ever met somebody like that? It's almost like the kamikaze. Mm -hmm. It's like what? Okay, I don't have anything to lose. Well, I'm going. And that's why I'm like, well, when you sent the email about burning ship, I'm like, this is an interesting concept. Yeah, because I think there was a general who got to an island and he burnt all the ships. That's Hernan Cortez. That's where the name comes from. Yep, exactly. and he continues to conquer South America. Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, those are the three things, right, for me. Like, okay, it has to be done, even with the studio and what we do now. For me, I don't believe in plan Bs. I just yeah. don't. I just don't like them. Yeah. Like, there is no plan B. This is it. Yeah. <laughs> like, if we We're don't going. make it, going. I'm going on to see the Lord. Like, yeah. that's it. Like, that's it. What What was most difficult for you? I think was most difficult. I'm going to tell you a funny story. We begin to open up the studio. Me and my wife work commercial production. We have five kids, so we don't have a lot of money. I had a buddy of mine who I used to service years ago who was like, man, you know, whatever you decide to do, I'm going to fund it. I'm going to fund it. Whatever Where is need. that for me? I know, right? <laughs> Where, and so I need one of those or two. He would say, you know, put the plan together, whatever yeah. you need. When the time come, I got you. And so, you know, all right. So I beginning. I begin to, you know, look at properties, look at designs, and I begin to do the real work. I even, um, my my agreement, my lease agreement, I actually did the contract on that myself uh, because I had to learn real yeah. quick about commercial property mm -hmm. and square footage and cams and fees and all this other stuff. But long story short, it came time to actually make the initial investment. And I called him like, hey, all right, I need some information. This is what I need. And he's like, oh, man, I'm sorry, I don't have it. And this is the day of. I need to get stuff in place to begin to get, you know, mm -hmm. the keys to the building yeah. and, you know, equipment and all this stuff. He didn't have anything. But what happened was I had told so many people my conviction and that passion. They didn't mind chipping in. Yeah. And so sometimes, what the, so what's the moral of the story, right? The moral of the story is that when you feel passionate about a thing that you're going to do, right, and you communicate that in such a way that people buy in and they believe in what you do, you have everything you need. And I didn't realize that until he pulled the rug from under me yeah. that I had to turn to these that people and say, hey, yeah, listen, this ain't going to work. That's a backwards gift, a yeah. blessing, you know. Yeah. yeah, it's contagious, that energy you bring to it. Yeah. Now I imagine that it. when you talk about what you're doing for your brand. Mm -hmm. To anybody who's listening who's a business, an entrepreneur, like when you have that passion, right, that why, and you begin to share that experience, like when you cast a vision for people, 
for why you do what you do, you don't have to ask for anything in return, mm-hmm. you know, because they just want to support. They want to help. See, what we do, we don't, we don't buy, we don't pay, we help people, you know. That's all we do. Mm-hmm. We're just here to help from a sincere place. And so for me, I carry that same spirit into everything that I do because I realize it's, it's not only carried me farther, but it's allowed a lot of grace for those down right. times, right? I love that word. Yep. Right? Grace is a good word. When I need somebody to like to be merciful with me mm-hmm. and understand my situation, even with brands. When you look at what's going on with Disney and a lot of other companies that are suffering right now, right, from a lot of cultural shock, yep. right? It's like once you've done your due diligence, you can still have favor because they still remember what you stand for. Also, keep in mind, another reason, uh, one of my first jobs, I worked at Disney because I'm from Orlando, Florida. Okay. Mm. And so my grandfather worked for Disney, my grandmother, my uncle, my aunts, my mom, and everybody in my family worked for Disney. So I understand branding on another level because Absolutely. your first job, you got to go. What a lot of people know that Magic Kingdom, most of it is underground. There's a whole city under there. So, yeah, once you become an employee, and that's where we are. It's like the elves who are working underground. <laughs> and so you're in these dark rooms, right? Yeah. And they're showing you this movie of Walt. And why? Like I'm fifteen, sixteen learning about Walt and his story. And I'm like, wow, this is this is crazy. So for me coming to Atlanta, even with what we do at our studio, initially our podcast studio is just for people who just want to try it out. Right. Okay. Just to try and see if it's something you want to do. Yeah. Almost like a ride. Sure. Mm-hmm. That experience, sure. right? So for us it's like a whole vibe because yep. the first thing any entrepreneur can do right now if you don't have anything else like create the experience around your business or what you do the service you provide if nothing else make people feel good about what you do mm-hmm. you'll get further farther faster yeah no that's a yeah that's a hundred percent clean way to say it to him it um it's hard to get to that place too i think Absolutely. speaking about that that about your business, I don't know, maybe you feel a little differently about this, but like the conviction was a hard place to get to for me because the self-confidence wasn't real for a long time. Mm. It was manufactured, you know what I mean? It was me convincing myself looking in the mirror that I'm an extrovert, Mm. that I go out and that I'm the one that dominates the room when I network, you know what I mean? Like Mm. that those things were, I brainwashed myself over four years of working here to believe those things. Mm. And then COVID happened and it was like, of all the time that you've spent convincing yourself that you're this extroverted salesperson killer. Now it means nothing to you. Now, Mm. now everybody can tell whether you are genuine and sincere Mm. by the way you speak about what you do. Mm. So we started COVID. We, we, the beginning of COVID, we were still credit card processing, but we were really truly helping people. Like we started doing virtual networking stuff. We started doing the podcasting stuff. And then I realized that I spoke about this thing in a way that I had never spoken about another piece of my business. Mm. Right. I was not a liar. I've never lied. I've never told people I could save them money when I wouldn't. I've never misrepresented what we do from a business perspective, but I've also never spoken never spoken with conviction up to this point about my ability to help people grow their business. Mm. Well, then I was at this point during COVID where I had grown this network and I had permeated so many of these different boundaries. I had such a diverse network because you meet people in so many different ways that I could speak about the impact that burn the ship had on your business and the impact that we were having with people from a credit card processing perspective and impact that we were having with people just having conversations and introducing them to our friends. Like that is a real, a real thing. Like learning how to speak that way Mm -hmm. is also kind of learned behavior. You kind of have to convince yourself that those things are true. You know what I mean? Like you're, if you are the one convincing yourself that you are confident in a way that you don't really believe you are, you're not alone. Like all all of that is faking it till you make it and and kind of starting off that way. And some people aren't that way. Some people truly are extroverted and, Mm -hmm. and put their personality on their sleeve and that's fine with them. But like, that's not natural to me. I don't know if it's it's natural to you. No, it isn't. No, I think it's a lot of like trusting yourself, right? Right. It it becomes difficult to like trust yourself when something thing is new especially right mm-hmm. especially if you ask for help though mm-hmm. you start to th- show the authenticity i think when i hear you yeah. that passion in the voice the passion in your voice right it's authentic mm-hmm. it's real it's contagious it's something people gravitate towards mm-hmm. it kind of opens up that door too of like i can help you because i've had to ask for help and so it's mm-hmm. like by opening like exposing yourself 
it's an amazing kind of step, right? Yeah. You take this step and it's like, I'm going to show some, I'm going to show you something that I've, I've been trying to hide or whatever. Mm -hmm. Then that person or that audience responds in such a way that you're like, well, it's empowering for you too, right? They mm -hmm. gain something, you gain something, and it kind of keeps growing to the next person, the next it's person. It's so impossible I, I like to that. fake vulnerability. It's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Vulnerability is probably the hardest thing that there is, like emotionally mm -hmm. to fake. Yeah. Can't, it's hard to be like disingenuous and be vulnerable at the same time, especially on the internet. People are smelling that from a mile yeah. away. I don't know. It's just a different thing speaking about your business in that way and being able to conduct yourself in a way where not that you know what you're doing or you're an expert in your field, but just mm -hmm. that you believe in who you are, that in your heart you want to help people is a different thing. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. just a different thing. Well, I will say this, though. One of the things that helped me um, is that there's a art to pitching. Now, I say this because we work in television, me and my mm -hmm. wife. We also did a show Wife Swap a couple of years back. And we pitched the network, and I told her how we're going to do it. Um, hmm. There's a way to communicate and you understand the language, right? One of the things I know to be true is that whenever you position your service or what you do as an opportunity, you never have to ask. Right. Right? That creates confidence, meaning when I walk in a room and there's hundreds of people that I don't know, it's almost like I get gold and I just discovered this thing, and I'm about to do this thing. Man, I would love for you to have an opportunity to join me in this thing. Look at what it can do. It's fascinating. I've been researching this for hundreds of years, right, and I've been alive for 40. But the <laughs> point is that, like, I've done so much into this, man. This is going to revolutionize and change everything moving forward, right? It's a great opportunity to be a part. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I've learned that once I create the opportunity, right, mm -hmm. I don't have to ask. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, because... Asking vulnerability mm -hmm. is very hard. Yeah. You know, I saw a Jesus commercial the other day, and it was interesting because they say, what are some things that are hard to say in the English English language? I think it's right. Uh, yeah, I think I've seen that one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But then they moved to words after they was like, okay, enunciation wasn't it. I didn't realize. I'm like, wow, this was great. Mm -hmm. Whoever developed this script, or script, right, or who produced it, because they moved from there to talking about words of vulnerability, you know, mm -hmm. apology. Like things that people typically have too much, I guess, pride mm -hmm. or ego yeah. to kind of humble themselves and do, right? And so, you know, those are like the life lessons. Like once you bake that inside of what you do as a business owner, as a service provider, even as an influencer, like once you begin to kind of use those characteristics, right, of opportunity to help people, right, bro? Mm -hmm. uh, and just understanding that, you know, we're not perfect, but you right. just do. Yeah. Right, and you move into those spaces, uh, it'll do something for your confidence. Again, I'm a natural introvert. I do not care much for spending time around large amounts of people. My wife is extrovert. She'll help a DJ close a club uh, just because mm -hmm. she needs mm -hmm. people's energy, right? Yeah. I don't. But I've learned to code switch, right? Mm -hmm. I know how, okay, now I need to be extroverted. So now it's like I'm going to do the most to make sure I present myself in a way that you feel confident about right. what I'm doing. Because, again, uh, if you think of business like a ship or an airplane, you're about to take people on. Your job is to get them up and to bring them down. Now, going up is one thing, coming down is another. But it's that middle place that's scary for you as the business owner. But for the person on that plane, they should never know. Mm -hmm. It's almost your job mm -hmm. to kind of modulate that and control that, right? It's because be you want to make sure that it's a smooth flight. You know, for me, that's a high honor mm -hmm. when somebody says, I want to do business with you or I want you to help me what I'm doing, you know. With that, it comes so much uh, responsibility like Spider-Man, right? Mm -hmm. Like with whom I just given, Right. And so when you understand that, you know, it definitely puts you in a different space of people who work in commodities, right? Yeah, well, Going back to high, yeah. like I'm just shopping based on price versus based on quality. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like Delta versus Red Tier. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you better have the yeah. leg room over here, yeah. right? But you can definitely have a good, you know, Jack and Coke if you need something to calm your nerves. And, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it's all good. And so, you know, making those distinctions, you know, all that's baked in what we do you yeah, know, mm -hmm. at our company. Anyways, like if you come in and we take you on, right? It's just kind of it's a cult. First, it's a culture mm -hmm. creating a culture, right? Absolutely. Like yep. it's a mindset. Like 
And, you know, <clears throat> Seth Golden talks about all the time, like drawing a line in the sand. We are people who do this. This is what we do. And it's like if you understand that, like this is the ride you want to go on. And if you take this ride, it'll be enjoyable. You know, it may not be the best you ever taken, but it'll at least get you to where you're trying to go to. Right. Mm-hmm. And if we can get you there, then I've done my job. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, I think the way that you, you speak and the way that you think is – um. It's just not the standard for your industry. You know what I mean? It's it's a uh, a much high, like we were talking about before. Is it's it's both thinking at a high level and making sure that you're hitting those key principles and living within those key principles, and also being very specific and making sure that yeah. you understand and display that you know your area of expertise and and are leveraging those things to be a benefit to the rest of humanity. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's a it's a cool thing. Let me ask you this. All right, this is the way that I end the podcast for everybody. Um, burn the ship. We talked about where that that name comes from and what that illusion means to us. And I think the stakes maybe are not the same, but entrepreneurship definitely has some some burn the ship moments, right? Everybody has that light switch moment where they're like, "Okay, I'm an entrepreneur now, and I've got to figure it out here." Or, you know, and that that negative, um, you know, that what you don't want to happen is always there present in your brain. Like, I don't want everybody to know that I started this business and failed, or I'm scared mm-hmm. to tell people about it because what if I don't make it, right? Like, mm-hmm. everybody has that moment where they're like, okay, I got to figure it out now or I'm never going to figure it out at all. And that's that burn the shit moment where you decide I'm an entrepreneur. It's time to be, you know, it's time to have a good time, right? What is that moment like? Because you've shared your story, right? And you've shared your skills and you've shared some of like what you believe your weaknesses are and just all all of those things throughout that journey of how you've presented yourself to be a value to small business. The only thing that I think the people that are listening can't relate to is what it feels like to make that switch mentally to being an entrepreneur and deciding that I'm going to figure it out. So for you, what is it like to burn the ship? What is it like to go all in on your business? What was that experience like? And what kind of emotions does it create? Why should other people seek out that same thing? Great question, and I'm going to tell you the word that comes to me is faith. It boils down to faith. When you burn the ship, essentially it's almost like walking on water, and you've never done it before. Dr. King talks about, you know, we, and I'm paraphrasing, is that you can't sometimes see the next step that's ahead of you, but at this point you know you got to take it. There's a speech that he said the night before he was assassinated when he says, I go to the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. One of the things he said that was said to me when my friend pulled the rug from up under me, he said that it really doesn't matter what happens to me now, meaning I'm so far into it, I can't turn back. He said because I've seen the promised land and the brother didn't even see it. He just had what was in his mind, Mm -hmm. right? Because I'm a brother of faith, there's a a scripture where – Jesus says that God's will to be done on earth as mm-hmm. it is in heaven. That's the vision, right? Mm-hmm. He saw the vision. I saw the vision. And so for me, it was a faith, meaning that regardless of what happens to you as a business owner, once you're all in and you've committed yourself, the way will reveal itself. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Jordan Peterson talks about in his book, 12 Steps. Uh, I forget the name of it. Good book, though. He says that when you shift your focus, right, from a negative to a positive, you realize there are so many things that you miss. I tell my sons this. I said, son, in order for you to pay attention to negative, you have to ignore positive. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for me, the walk of faith of saying, look, the rug was pulled from under me. He ain't got the money. And I had all my ducks or all of my eggs in that basket simply meant I needed to shift focus, right? It was a scary moment because I wasn't sure, but I knew this. There was no plan B. Right. It's going to happen. How come hell? Mm -hmm. You know, I've already committed myself. And once a man hands to the plow, you can't take it off, much like a roller coaster ride. Once you Mm -hmm. lock in, you just get ready for the ride. Now, how that looks don't even matter at this point. The thing that I said I'm going to do. It has to be done. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have attitude. to be in the yeah. same form, right? But you have to do something. So if you're stuck as an entrepreneur, if you're stuck as a business, or if you're just stuck in life in general, simply shifting your focus, going back to your original commitment of what you said you was going to do, and just go balls to the wall, if I can say that, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. There's no way you can fail, right? Right. 
because success is what you deem it. So that would be my advice. I appreciate you <laughs> That's been tremendously. Excellent. Um, man, my only regret is that we did this on Tuesday <laughs> that rather than a Monday. You know what I mean? I would have got a whole week of, of fire. Um, no, this has been a wonderful conversation. Like I said, I, I just think your thought process is different. Obviously, that comes from having a different experience and how you kind of waded into the water and, and – how you decided that the value that you want to bring to people is a little different than what puts money in your pocket. You know what yeah. I mean? It's yeah. separating the the impact that you have from the impact on your bank account is is a wonderful, powerful thing. And uh, I couldn't imagine someone from a from a branding perspective and a marketing perspective and a and a people perspective that's better to have in your corner. So I I appreciate you making the trip. It does mean a lot. Well, we'll edit this over a couple of weeks and we'll put it out there to the world. And if you want it, you're you're more than welcome to the full yeah. video file. But We'll get to work on it, my friend. It does mean a lot that you made the trip. Well, I appreciate you Tell guys. Tell people for um, me. Mm -hmm. how to find you, just in case they want to buy something from you. Well, I, well, you can definitely go to our website, theplugatl.net. Uh, we have you know a few different services. Again, we're agency. Then we just have the building. So, if you're content creator looking, if you need to make some content, we definitely have a studio for that. Uh, if you need a little bit more support, maybe in discovering what you're trying to do. Uh, you can also book that consultation as well. Uh, me and my team, we would love to help you get to get you to where you're trying to get to. So, cool. thanks, guys. This has been great. Thank you, my thank friend. You thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Oh yeah, it's great to meet you. Burn the ship. Burn the ship.